Hello, and welcome to the college's webinar on supervision. We're very pleased to share this resource with you, and we hope that you will find it beneficial. Speaking to you today is Christina Van Sickle, Director of Professional Practice, and my colleague Sue Kowalski, who is the Professional Practice Associate. The Professional Practice Department contributes to the ongoing development of practice resources, such as this webinar, and oversees the Continuing Competence Program. We also respond to practice inquiries from members and other stakeholders and present across the province on a variety of topics. Professional, ethical, qualified, accountable. Every presentation from the college begins with these keywords. These four words describe what the public can expect when they are working with a registered social worker or social service worker. Through their registration with the college, members demonstrate that they are professionals who subscribe to a code of ethics and standards of practice. They're committed to delivering services ethically and professionally. They're qualified through their ongoing participation in the college's mandatory continuing competence program and accountable to their clients, the college, and themselves. Regulation brings credibility to the professions. It says something important about the professions of social work and social service work as a whole, and also about you as individual practitioners. Registration with the college demonstrates to employers and to the public that the member has met specific registration requirements, follows a code of ethics and standards of practice, and engages in ongoing learning throughout the college's continuing competence program. All of our work at the college is grounded in these concepts, which are reflected throughout this presentation. <clears throat> the professional practice department gets asked about supervision on a regular basis. The scopes of practice for both professions include the provision of supervision to social workers, social service workers, students, and other supervisees. It's important to note that a supervisor has professional accountability for the supervision services that they provide, and that a supervisee is defined as a client within the Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice Handbook. In our presentation today, we hope to address some of the most frequently asked questions about this topic. We will be exploring how the standards of practice may apply to supervision, the differences between consultation and supervision, and issues to consider when both receiving and providing supervision. Throughout the webinar, you're welcome to use the chat function and to ask us questions to expand upon topics from the presentation or ask us about a supervision topic that we didn't touch on. Off screen, we are being supported by Liz and she's going to be collecting your questions and grouping similar questions together, um, which we will discuss during the question period at the end of the webinar. If we aren't able to get to your question during the allotted time for the question period, which will end promptly at one, um, then we will encourage you to please, at the end of the webinar, you will find our contact information, and you can also find our contact information on the website. Please do reach out to us directly with your supervision inquiries, and we'll be happy to respond to you. Oh, and so that you're aware as well, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the college website afterwards. The Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice Handbook contain eight principles that set out the minimum standards of professional practice and ethical conduct. For each principle, interpretations are provided to further guide college members. In applying these principles to their own practice situations, it is suggested that members read and consider all eight principles together as a whole. The standards of practice are meant to be applied to a member's practice in conjunction with any applicable legislation and with their professional judgment. For the purposes of this webinar, we will highlight those interpretations within the principles that may assist when seeking or providing supervision. The first principle that we'd like to discuss is principle two, competence and integrity. Competence is a key factor in terms of providing or receiving supervision. Members may seek supervision to support and enhance their competence throughout their careers. Members may determine that they are competent to provide supervision after they have developed extensive practice skills and knowledge. The skills needed to provide supervision safely, ethically, and professionally are honed after a member has been practicing in the field for over an extended period and after they've obtained their own ongoing supervision and training. Interpretation two, 
5.1.1 indicates that college members are responsible for being aware of the extent and parameters of their competence, their professional scope of practice, and limit their practice accordingly. When a client's needs fall outside the college member's usual area of practice, the member informs the client of the option to be referred to another professional. If, however, the client wishes to continue the professional relationship with the college member and have the member provide the service, the member may do so, provided that they ensure that the services are provided competently by seeking additional supervision, consultation, or education, and that the services are not beyond the member's professional scope of practice. Interpretation 2.1.5 states that as part of maintaining competence and acquiring skills in social work or social service work practice, college members engage in the process of self-review and evaluation of their practice and seek consultation when appropriate. Principle 3, Responsibility to Clients. Responsibility of clients focuses on members providing professional services responsibly. Within the context of supervision, the supervisor is providing a direct or clinical social work or social service work service, and the client is the supervisee. Interpretation 3.1 states that college members provide clients with accurate and complete information regarding the extent, nature, and limitations of any services available to them. Interpretation 3.6 indicates that college members inform clients of foreseeable risks as well as rights, opportunities, and obligations associated with the provision of professional services. In the context of supervision, this means that the supervisors ensure that the supervisees have the information that they require to know and what to expect during supervision to make informed decisions about how they can benefit from and get the most out of their supervisory relationship. Principle four, the social work and social service work record deals with documentation. Documentation is an, is an essential component of practice. It provides a place for a member to record and reflect on a client's ongoing needs, as well as a format to plan, set, and evaluate goals. The requirement to document services pertains to the supervisory relationship as well. The purpose of the record is for members to document services in a recognizable form to ensure quality service and to establish accountability for and evidence of the services rendered. College members ensure that records are current, accurate, and contain relevant information about clients, are managed in a manner that protects client privacy, and are in accordance with any applicable privacy or other legislation. Interpretation 4.1.3 states that college members must keep systematic, dated, and legible records for each client or client system served. In the context of supervision, this means that both the supervisee and the supervisor must keep notes about their supervisory sessions. When the member is the supervisee, they should document in the client record any guidance or information that they receive from the supervision that will help inform client care. This establishes accountability for and evidence of the decision-making and intervention planning process. Likewise, the member who is providing supervision should also document in their supervisee's record when they give guidance or information that will assist the supervisee in providing client care. Confidentiality is a cornerstone of all professional practice. College members respect the privacy of clients by holding their information in strict confidence. When providing supervision, it is of course essential to keep any information shared during sessions confidential. This may include identifying client information. When receiving supervision, the supervisee must inform the clients that some of their information may be shared with the supervisor in order to assist in client care and to develop a member's competence. Interpretation 5.4 requires that college members must inform clients early in their relationship of the limits of confidentiality of information. 
in clinical practice when services delivered in the context of supervision or multidisciplinary professional teams. College members explain to clients the need for sharing pertinent information to supervisors. Allied professionals, paraprofessionals, administrative co-workers, students, volunteers, and appropriate accreditation bodies. College members respect their clients' right to withhold or withdraw consent and to place conditions potentially and to, regarding disclosure of their information. In other words, supervisees should share with their clients that their own supervision may include information about the client's clinical sessions and that they will also offer the client the opportunity to decide what is discussed within the limits of confidentiality. Interpretation 5.8 states that college members should be aware of the distinction between consultation and supervision as it pertains to sharing client information. In consultation, clients are not identified. We will be further discussing the distinction between consultation and supervision in the next few slides. So we're going to shift gears now to a discussion about the various factors to consider when receiving supervision. The Social Work Dictionary defines supervision as an administrative and educational process used extensively in social agencies to help social workers further develop and refine their skills, enhance staff morale, and provide quality service for the clients. This definition also applies to social service workers. Distinguishing between a clinical and administrative supervision is important. Clinical supervision focuses on assessment, intervention, and evaluation of client interventions, as well as critical self-reflection. Administrative supervision focuses on the aspects of the member's role in an agency. While administrative supervision is important and necessary, it's not adequate or sufficient for members in private practice or those performing or wanting to perform the controlled active psychotherapy. In many practice settings, members may receive administrative supervision from a non-college member, and they may also receive varying degrees of clinical supervision. The college does not have the authority to require employers to provide clinical supervision, but it does require its members to seek supervision as required and to use it effectively. Members may receive clinical supervision from someone outside the profession who has the relevant expertise and experience in their area of practice and setting. In this case, members should consider whether the supervisor has an understanding of social work and social service work values, ethics, and standards of practice to determine whether additional input from a college member may be required to obtain the profession-specific supervision that they need. Likewise, members may supervise someone from outside the professions. In this instance, the member should have the requisite understanding of the supervisee's code of ethics and standards of practice. Supervision should always focus on enhancing competence and developing practice knowledge that is effective, culturally relevant, and ethically sound while meeting the standards for the specific intervention. At this point, we're going to turn to the difference between supervision and consultation that was mentioned earlier. Throughout this presentation and in the literature, you may hear supervision and consultation used somewhat interchangeably. While similar, they are different. As mentioned previously, in consultation, client identifying information is kept confidential. Consultation is a problem-solving process in which advice and knowledge as well as reflection on the member's practice is offered by someone specialized with expertise knowledge. This may or may not be a member of the college. The relationship between a supervisor and a social worker or social service worker may be one that is assigned by their employer or an organization on an ongoing basis due to the structure of their role or the organization. In this case, the member may be primarily receiving administrative supervision, although in some cases, there may be a clinical component. On the other hand, 
the relationship between a consultant and a college member is typically voluntary and maybe time limited and focused on a specific content or the development of special skills and expertise. Consultants may be engaged to help social workers or social service workers identify gaps in knowledge, blocks in understanding, or to assist them in exploring other ways of seeing issues. Common examples of consultation are peer consultation and consultation groups. Peer consultation brings together individuals, sometimes with a range of professional orientations, to provide specific assistance related to care or practice issues. This type of consultation provides exposure to a wide range of problem-solving techniques and the opportunity to compare practice experiences and generate different observation and suggestions between peers. Peer consultation can occur individually, though it is more typically provided in groups. Benefits of this model include members obtaining moral support and increasing their self-confidence and self-awareness. Members may also choose to consult more widely with colleagues, managers, or a lawyer, for example. Additionally, members may consult with the professional practice staff at the college who can help them identify the standards of practice that are relevant to a particular scenario and that may guide decision making. While practice consultations with the professional practice department are a common example of consultation, they are not the same as supervision, nor are they an adequate substitute. Supervision can take place in individual or group sessions. And while individual sessions may be the most common setup for supervision, group sessions are becoming more common. The, tra the traditional model is one where the college member and their supervisor meet regularly. The most typical activity is case discussion. The supervisor models critical thinking skills and examines the supervisee's work, encouraging openness and honesty about practice through the sharing of feelings, thoughts, and struggles. In the past, organizations frequently offered this model of supervision to their staff. While this model of supervision is not as frequent as it once was, it still occurs in some settings. Members in private practice may also contract with a supervisor to provide supervision that typically follows this traditional model. In some instances, agencies may arrange for supervision to be provided by an external supervisor on a contractual basis. This would typically occur when the agency is not in a position to provide a clinical supervisor internally. Additionally, some members have independently chosen to reach out and contract with an external supervisor in order to receive the clinical, the clinical supervision that they require. Lastly, college members may be supervised by someone from outside the profession who has the relevant expertise and experience in their area of practice and or setting. As mentioned previously, the member should consider whether the supervisor has an understanding of the profession's values, code of ethics, and standards of practice, and determine whether additional input from other sources may be required to obtain the profession-specific supervision that they need. Whatever their profession, supervisors should be members in good standing with their respective regulatory body. receiving supervision, the standards of practice do not set specific requirements regarding the frequency of supervision for members. At different stages of their career, less experienced members may wish to arrange more frequent, structured, and regular supervision. They may develop knowledge, skills, and gain experience this way. Even the most experienced member may encounter client situations that are challenging or outside their area of experience and competence. For these reasons, the standards of practice require all members to seek supervision or consultation in these circumstances. The need for supervision does not end after a certain period in practice, but evolves and continues throughout a member's career. Preparation for both supervision and consultation meetings is desirable. 
consider the following. What will be the focus of the meeting? What questions do I need to ask? What do I hope to achieve in the supervision meeting? What materials do I have to prepare for the meeting? Supervision and the opportunities that it provides for critical self-reflection and professional growth are central components of ethical social work and social service work practice. The literature on post-degree supervision consistently indicates that good supervision enhances job retention, increases job satisfaction, reduces turnover within organizations, and protects practitioners against burnout. More importantly, it promotes high quality of care to clients. We often get asked by members, how much supervision do I need? And supervision needs will vary depending on the college member, the practice setting, and the client population served. Some members may also seek out supervision in order to gain competence in a practice area or modality in which they don't have previous experience. In these instances, members may be motivated by a desire to enhance their current practice or to move into a different role or practice setting. The college does not set specific rules around how much supervision a member must receive. However, the practice guidelines for performing the controlled act of psychotherapy do speak to this issue. Whether or not a member wishes to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy, the practice guidelines offer helpful direction that is transferable to many areas of practice. The practice guidelines suggest that members with less than three years postgraduate experience should ideally be receiving supervision that takes place individually or in a small group, occurs regularly and with a frequency that is appropriate to the member's level of experience, provides opportunities to engage in case discussion and the learning of new skills and perspectives, includes at least some direct observation of a member's practice, and this may be in the form of audio or video recording, one-way mirrors, co-therapy or reflecting teams, provides opportunities for in-depth experiential and didactic learning in an interactional and supportive environment, and enables members opportunity for critical self-reflection. The practice guidelines suggest that supervision for members with more experience could be less frequent and more informal models of supervision may be appropriate. Members should seek supervision or consultation with experienced colleagues throughout their careers, particularly in areas of practice in which they are less experienced, when they are aware of a strong reaction, either negative or positive to a client, or when the client could benefit from the member gaining an additional perspective, outside expertise, and or a new skill or approach. The supervision obtained by members with more experience should occur regularly and with a frequency that is appropriate to the member's level of experience, may be less formal and structured, may use a group or peer consultation model in addition to or as an alternative to individual or small group supervision with an experienced supervisor, should be sufficiently accessible that members may obtain assistance in challenging or complex clinical work in a timely manner, and should be provided in an environment which enables members to examine their own reactions to their clinical work. Access to regular supervision is essential to members in private practice. The need for supervision evolves and changes throughout a member's career, but it never disappears. This is particularly true in a private practice setting. Private practice typically involves counseling and the provision of psychotherapy services. While members may not plan to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy, providing services to a client that meet the definition of the controlled act can and do occur in the context of private practice. The practice guidelines for performing the controlled act of psychotherapy indicate that members are not fully prepared to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy until they have completed two or three years or two to 3,000 hours of supervised experience. 
Therefore, it is advisable for members embarking on private practice to do so only after obtaining extensive experience and supervision and to ensure that they have set up regular access to supervision throughout their private practice career. Members in private practice face a multitude of complex practice issues which they must deal with independently. While private practice offers an opportunity to work in a way that one chooses, it can also be isolating. Failing to take time to think through critical and ethical issues on their own and in supervision can lead to members making errors with potentially serious and or harmful consequences. We've been discussing issues that members should consider when receiving supervision. We're now going to discuss considerations for members who provide or intend to provide supervision. The college does not define specific qualification for members providing supervision, but as mentioned earlier, these members must consider whether they have the requisite experience, skills, knowledge and judgment to competently provide this social work or social service work service. Members who are considering whether they are competent to provide supervision should review Principle 2, Competence and Integrity, and the practice note, but how do I know if I'm competent, to help make this determination. Members who wish to supervise others should also consider whether they have the cumulative and specific experience and expertise in the field that is relevant for the member requesting the supervision, including the client population that the member serves. Supervision should offer the social worker or social service worker insights about the practice issues and administrative activities which support the development of expertise. In the clinical context, supervisors typically set learning objectives, which will facilitate the development of the supervisee's competence within an area of practice, rather than their personal issues and growth. It is this difference in focus which distinguishes supervision from therapy. The main tasks of supervisors include teaching, supporting, educating, and carrying out administrative functions. Supervisors ask probing questions to encourage the worker to think conceptually, explore alternatives, and jointly seek solutions for client outcomes. Research suggests that social workers tend to practice with individuals and families by replicating the supervisory system. In order to maintain their competence, supervisors should explore opportunities to develop their supervisory skills, whether through additional additional formalized training, supervision of their supervision, or mentorship. Supervisory relationships should be given much thought and consideration, as supervisors share some responsibility for the client services provided by their supervisees, and could be held accountable for inadequate supervision when a supervisee's conduct is in question. The professional misconduct regulation made under the Social Work and Social Service Work Act defines failing to supervise adequately a person who's under the professional responsibility of the member and who is providing social work or social service work service as an act of professional misconduct. As with all clinical relationships, the college member must consider the standards of practice first when providing supervisory services. For example, if there will be a fee for a supervisor's service, the supervisor should reflect on Principle 6, Fees, Interpretation 6.1.1, which indicates that college members explain in advance or at the commencement of services the basis of all charges, giving a reasonable estimate of projected fees and disbursements, pointing out any uncertainties involved so that clients which in this case would be the supervisee, may make informed decisions with regard to using a member services. Members providing supervision must also ensure that they maintain clear and appropriate boundaries and avoid conflicts of interests and or dual relationships with supervisees that could impair their professional judgment. Lastly, members who are providing supervision are strongly encouraged to obtain professional liability insurance. 
there are several specific considerations with respect to supervising individuals who are performing the controlled act of psychotherapy. Social work and social work students are permitted to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy under the supervision or direction of a member of this college when the student is fulfilling the requirements to become a member of this college. Therefore, members of the college who are competent to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy are permitted to supervise students performing the controlled act of psychotherapy, but only those students who are completing their studies to become a member of this college. College members are also permitted to supervise other regulated professionals who are performing the controlled act of psychotherapy, as long as they belong to one of the other six Ontario regulatory colleges who are authorized to perform the controlled act. Some regulatory colleges have set out specific criteria for supervisors who are supervising members of their college. In these instances, college members must contact that regulatory body in order to determine if they meet those criteria. The standards of practice may also differ for members of the other colleges. For example, members of the College of Psychologists, or CPO, have a specific definition of supervision in their standards of practice, which differs from the one described in the college's standards of practice. If a member intends to approach a psychologist for training, support, consultation, or membership, they, wish, they will wish to state that they are seeking consultation and or membership, mentorship, excuse me, rather than supervision. For more information, college members are advised to visit the CPO website. As previously mentioned, Members may choose to seek supervision from a member of one of the other regulatory colleges whose members are authorized to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy in order to enhance their skills in this area. Throughout this webinar, we have presented some of the professional and ethical considerations for members of the college who are receiving or providing supervision. As always, members must begin by considering the standards of practice. Members should reflect upon their own supervisory needs, the differences between consultation and supervision, and the different supervisory models to determine how best to enhance their skills and competence in order to provide high quality care to the clients they serve. It is also important to note that the provision of supervision requires specialized skills that do not evolve automatically from direct practice. Members may wish to take on a supervisory role. Members who wish to take on a supervisory role should therefore reflect upon their level of competence and explore opportunities to develop their supervisory skills, whether through additional formalized training, supervision of their supervision, or mentorship. In ever-evolving and challenging practice environments, members must be committed to meeting their own needs for supervision and or developing their supervisory skills in order to ensure that clients are served competently, ethically, and responsibly. So we're going to be showing you now some resources that we used in order to create the webinar today. And you'll be able to find a handout that have these resources on it in the little box um, of your chat and your, your webinar function there, the gray box, there's a heading that says handouts. You'll find two handouts in there. One is with these resources listed and there's links to each of the resources for your own further learning if you were interested. And then there's also a handout there, uh, which is a certificate of completion, which you can print off and fill out and keep for your records. You can utilize as part of your continuing competence program as well. Um, I did want to remind you as well that the webinar is being recorded, and so it is going to be available uh, shortly on the college website and the college's YouTube channel as well. And so we're gonna shift now into the question period, and we have had Liz off screen furiously taking your notes and collecting your questions and grouping them together. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier as well, that we've had thankfully a great interest in the supervision, supervision webinar rather, um, and we're really, really happy about that. But because of that, we may not be get, able to get to all of the questions. Um, and if we're not, then we do have our contact information at the end of this webinar, and you can also find our contact information on the website as well. And we would welcome you and invite you to please contact Sue and I directly so that we can then respond to your questions that way. So. I'm going to pause for a sip of water, and I'm also going to ask Liz to start with our first question. Are there any guidelines for how often supervision or peer supervision should be done for frontline clinicians? Not specifically, no. Um, you know, as we indicated in the webinar, that your supervision needs or consultation needs are going to vary on a variety of different factors. Um, one could be your level of experience. Um, it could be you might be a very experienced individual who is moving to a new practice setting or working with a new client group, or perhaps you're even providing services to a client that has needs which you're not familiar of or have not dealt with beforehand. Um, so certainly there's going to be times in our career and throughout our career where we might need more consultation or more supervision um, than others. And so it's then the um, requirement of the member to utilize their professional judgment to determine the frequency um, and level of supervision that they require throughout their career, which again, at the beginning may be more frequent, but if you do have a change in career as you go along, such as changing fields or utilizing different modalities, you will again likely need to have more frequent and um, consistent supervision when you make those changes. Can a psychotherapist supervise a social worker in psychotherapy? Can a social, I, you know, I didn't repeat the question beforehand, so I just want to make sure that we're getting them. So can a psychotherapist supervise a social worker in psychotherapy? Yes. <laughs> the, short yeah, the short answer to that is yes. Um, anybody who belongs to one of the six regulatory bodies in Ontario who has access to the controlled active psychotherapy can supervise one of the other members of the regulatory colleges as well. Are there any rules or policies around how frequently an MSW providing private psychotherapy should meet with a supervisor? So any rules around how frequently an MSW who's in private practice and meeting privately with clients should meet with a supervisor? Again, you know, this is going to be something that certainly, um, you know, we've talked about this funny enough in the private practice webinar that we did last time, that certainly when we're doing private practice, it's not an entry to practice competence. Um, it's something that, similar to supervision, um, it doesn't just, those skills don't evolve naturally from direct practice, that it requires ongoing education and training. Um, so certainly an MSW um, who is providing uh, private practice um, and is obviously looking for supervision, which is a, a good thing to do and something you certainly want to be doing, um, it's going to be very dependent upon their individual needs, the needs of their clients. Um, you know, I think typically members do determine with their supervisor in the beginning, are they meeting you know, every week, every two weeks, every month, that's going to be very different. Um, however, I would recommend that when you do have a uh, are creating that relationship with a supervisor that you do want to ensure that at those times that are in between sessions that you have planned for it as an example let's say every two weeks if you have a crisis that comes up in between those two supervisory sessions hopefully you have some sort of ad hoc arrangement where you'd be able to reach out to that supervisor um, to be able to get some crisis or some uh, more um, guidance or help in between those supervisory sessions if it were required. Anything to add to that? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's covered. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. In the UK and some states, supervision is a certification or diploma mm -hmm. beyond the MSW. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that that exists in Ontario um, to meet the Ontario supervision requirements? It's a very good question, and you're quite right that there are a lot of um, supervisory certificates that exist out there. Um, in Ontario, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have that same type of certificate. However, um, there certainly are supervisory courses that you can find. Um, certainly, um, if you decide to take on a field placement student, that is actually one of the areas where you can get some supervision training. Um, certain uh, 
schools of social work and social service work do provide that ongoing training uh, for their field education supervisors. So that's certainly one avenue uh, in Ontario where you can get ongoing supervisors supervisory or supervision uh, training and experience um, but certainly I mean doing a Google search and trying to figure out what different courses are available out there is another option um, but I am aware that certainly some schools of social work and social service work have fantastic ongoing professional development training sessions for their field education providers uh, so that might be a way to, to really hone in on some of those skills. Where can I get a list of social workers that provide supervision? If you go uh, to findasocialworker.ca, uh, it's a website that lists uh, all a bunch of social workers who are in the province of Ontario, and you can search for um, individuals who, it, everyone has listed kind of what their specialty is, and some individuals or the individuals who provide supervision will have listed uh, that they provide supervision. And so you can uh, discrete your search by uh, geographic location and also by terms of specialization, I believe. And you should be able to find a social worker through findasocialworker.ca who can provide you with supervision. Is it ethical to end the supervisor supervisee relationship if the supervisor deems the supervisee is not following recommended advice? That's a very good question. I think what you'd need to consider at that point in time is again, um, we talk about obviously the supervisor supervisee relationship is a clinical relationship. And so that you'd have to consider it uh, the same way as, as terminating with a client relationship. And so you'd really need to consider uh, the interpretations that are in principle three, uh, interpretation, uh, which is responsibility to clients, uh, interpretation 3.9 and 3.10. Um, where it talks about what are the requisite considerations when terminating with a client. And it could be perhaps that you're discontinuing with this client you know, because you feel that you've reached an impasse at your supervisory um, experience, that you feel that they're not absorbing the information that you're providing to them, but then it would be the requirement to at least give them either the time or the assistance in order to make alternative arrangements. And this is going to be our last question because we're just coming to the end of our time together. Do you have suggestions for hospital social workers who are being asked to perform the controlled act of psychotherapy but don't feel competent and don't have any access to supervision? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's certainly something that Sue and I have heard as well. And certainly, you know, members are responsible for being aware of the extent of their practice and limiting their practice accordingly. So if you have identified that you are not competent to provide a practice um, and that there isn't the support for you to gain that competence, then it's your professional accountability to say, I'm not the person who's able to provide this. Um, and certainly when Sue and I have managed those phone calls that we have assisted members to go through the standards of practice. The one that I just referred to specifically was principle two, competence and integrity 2.11. Um, and we sometimes help members pull from the standards of practice um, to provide them with some uh, information that they can take back to their management to say, you know, I am able to provide this if I was competent to do so. However, with the absence of supervision or ongoing training knowledge and experience, this isn't something I'm able to do and would be then required to refer my client um, to another onward uh, referral source who is able to provide that service. So certainly we have helped members kind of craft those conversations that they're going to have with managers. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned, our contact information, if it's not up now, it's about to be up. I think Liz is just putting it up now. Yep, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, you're more than welcome to either contact us directly uh, to help you shape that conversation, or by all means, give your manager or employer our contact information, and we'd also be happy to talk with them about what are the professional responsibilities of our members. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end of our time today. Um, those were really great questions, everyone. That was a really fun part of the webinar for us. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and your collaboration today. And as I mentioned, the webinar will be recorded and available on the website shortly. Um, and by all means, if you have further questions, you've got our contact information. It's also available on the college website. So please do contact us with your direct questions and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you so much.